Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, now for something completely different, although, <laughs> although not that different, I, I was reflecting on what Iona has just been talking about and what Trisha Greenhouse talked about this morning as well. And I agree entirely with, with absolutely everything they said. Um, and both of them were demanding that we take uh, a less simplistic, more mature, more sophisticated approach to integrating evidence with, I'm going to say everything else, because I don't have a word to describe everything you talked about. I have absolutely no problem with any of anything they said. But what they didn't emphasize, because they were emphasizing the, the non-scientific part, is, is that to practice good medicine, you also have to have a sophisticated, mature, and not a simplistic understanding of the epidemiological evidence. And, and you know, I was taken by Trisha's presentation this morning, and she didn't really talk much about it, but, much about it, but she had a very sophisticated, under, as she does, understanding of the epidemiological evidence. And so it's, it, it is a prerequisite to, to any mature approach to practicing evidence-based medicine that you do have a sophisticated understanding of, of how to appraise the evidence, how to search out the valid evidence and how to interpret it. And, and I don't think, I think I only would agree, she's nodding. We do. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today is, 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 is a tool just to help you think about that evidence. And if, if you would humor me, um, if, if you have a piece of paper in front of you and a pen, could you draw this on a piece of paper? Could you just draw this, please? Um, I know you've all got electronic things now, but, but if you do have a piece of paper, could, could, could you draw that? Thank you very much. If you... So, and you can take your time, you can take the whole lecture if you like, but if, if you've drawn that, you've just drawn the shape of every epidemiological study. You've just drawn the shape of every epidemiological study. And, and during this talk, I hope you're going to fill this in, because um, there's a bit more to add to it. Um, but I thought I'd start, I've, I've, I think this is probably the first time I've ever put a conflicts of interest slide up, which I probably don't really need to in this meeting, but I'm a full-time salaried academic, I'm paid by the University of Auckland since 1990, for the 10 years before that, I was paid by the Health Research Council. Every, all my research, and I'm actually a cardiovascular disease epidemiologist, that's my other job, is funded by public good resource, uh, sources. I occasionally get paid to run courses on critical appraisal. You're getting a free one today. Uh, well, some, well, I'm not getting paid. Um, I fre have frequently traveled um, and received funding for accommodation to speak at conferences like this, most of which I think were not funded by the pharmaceutical industry or the alcohol industry, um, and um, I developed tools um, uh, to help people understand and apply epidemiological evidence, and every tool I've developed is free. Um, uh, this was one of them that some of you might have seen, um, that's free, but today I'm gonna talk about another tool, and it's called GATE, and it stands for the Graphic Appraisal Tool for Epidemiology, and um, my, my objective today is to teach you everything you need to know about critical appraisal with one picture, two formulas, and three acronyms. Um, I'm just gonna give you the outline. It normally takes me about an hour to teach this, but I have to do this in about 20 minutes. Um, and um, it's taken me 25 years almost to do this, so I've got a hell of a lot to cover in, in 20 minutes. Um, my inspiration, oh, oh, this is the other point. Gate um, does stand, started life as a graphic appraisal tool for epidemiology, but it's also a graphic architectural tool for epidemiology. It's a graphic approach to epidemiology, but it's really designed, it's a tool designed to make epidemiology accessible. Um, and my inspiration was fourth year medical students in 1991. Now, I, I spent the 70s training and practicing in clinical medicine, and then in the 1980s I retrained in public health epidemiology and after a postdoc in the United States at the end of the 80s, I came back to New Zealand in 1990 
to a senior lectureship um, in epidemiology, and I was told I had to teach medical students epidemiology. And of course, at that stage, all I knew was public health epidemiology. In fact, I'd been taught that um, clinical epidemiology was an oxymoron at the time. Um, uh, so I didn't know anything about it. But as a result of, of these students, um, I decided that I needed uh, to teach them something that would keep them awake. And so I've spent the last 25 years trying to keep fourth year medical students awake, or trying to do things to make them. And I should have brought a picture of them today, but most of them are awake uh, when I teach them now. Um, my other inspiration is um, Jerry Morris, who actually wrote a book that was incredibly difficult to read, but he did say one thing, and he said that epidemiology was numerator over denominator. And that sold me on epidemiology as a career, because it just seemed conceptually simple, and I, I liked it. And um, it, yeah, so he's my other inspiration. And my final inspiration is each year I teach about 1,100 uh, 18 year olds, every student who wants to do medicine or nursing or pharmacy or anything to do with health in the University of Auckland has to take a course that I run. Um, and there's two lecture theatres identical size, about takes about 600 in each, one above the other, and some of them get to see me. They're a bit of a blur, as you can see. Um, and the others just see a video of me, but, um, but it's all in real time. So they, I hone everything that I've tried to develop in, in, in teaching evidence-based medicine, teaching epidemiology, has been honed by keeping these people awake. Um, so in, in this short time I have, I'm going to go through four topics, four sections. I'm going to talk about this gate frame, that picture that you've drawn as, as a framework for design, study design, study analysis, study error, and, um, and as a framework for practicing EBM. It's, it's really designed as something to help you remember the kinds of things you need to cover. So let's, let's start with design. Well, there's the picture that you've drawn, and every epidemiological study can, be, can actually be hung on this picture. Um, whenever I read a paper, I draw this gate frame um, actually on every page, and I fill it in as I go through. Um, here's an example, uh, this famous study, British doctors in the triangle who were allocated um, by measurement to smokers and non-smokers, allocated by measurement or allocated by observation, which is why it's an observational study. So there are the two groups, smokers and non-smokers. They were followed initially for 10 years, uh, and some of them got lung cancer and some of them didn't. Um, longitudinal study, incident study, um, so you can teach incidents with this arrow, um, and that's, that's the design, the standard design of a, of a, of a cohort study. Um, the, the first acronym is PCOT. Now, many of you would have heard of PICO. Um, this, is, this is the epidemiologist version of PICO. I'd never heard of PICO when I created PCOT. I, I did it completely independent. It's bizarre. Um, and it was simply because I'd never being taught anything about clinical epidemiology, but to an epidemiologist, P is the same, the participants, uh, I for intervention to an epidemiologist is exposure, it's more generic, comparison is pretty much the same, outcomes are always the same, but timing is everything in epidemiology, so I had to add a T, where the, the T is silent in PICO, um, but it's still there. And this is just a randomized trial, it looks the same as the other picture, except this case you allocate people this goes to aspirin or placebo at randomly rather than allocate by measurement. Um, uh, here's a cross-sectional study. So I teach prevalence. The arrow goes sideways. Um, if you measure something at one point in time, you've got a prevalence measure. American women, in this case, body mass index measured. Some are overweight, some are normal weight. Uh, some of them have diabetes, some of them don't. Cross-sectional study. Uh, our diagnostic test prediction study. So take the same women, some have a positive mammogram, some have a negative mammogram, and among those with positive, some have breast cancer, some don't. And then if you have, rather than a diagnostic test prediction study, you have a diagnostic test accuracy study, well then, in fact, um, you start with those with breast cancer and those without breast cancer using gold standard, and among some women with breast cancer, some of them have a positive test, so that's the likelihood of a positive test given breast cancer. That's the likelihood of a positive test given no breast cancer. You get likelihood ratios. So 
your question, how you fill this frame in all depends on your question. Um, case control study, every case control study is nested within a virtual cohort study. So there are your cases, there are your controls. What's the key question when you're critically appraising a case control study is do the cases come from the same population as the controls? So it's a, it's a, it's a nice tool for thinking about um, the appraisal of evidence. So that's all I, oh, and um, if you can find an epidemiological study that doesn't fit into the gate frame, I'll give you 100 pounds. Um, I, I tell my students I give them $10,000, but I thought you might be maybe a bit smarter than my students. So <laughs> I, I probably could afford 100 pounds, um, but not $10,000. So let's move on to the second. So that's design, that's design. Let's do um, uh, analysis. So I come to the first formula. I've done one picture, uh, one acronym, and let's go to the first formula. So my first formula is, is that occurrence equals outcomes divided by population. Um, and basically, this is the numbers part. All the numbers in epidemiology can, be, can fit on the gate frame. Um, and, and so I'm just going to introduce a slightly more, little bit more jargon. So I've now changed E and C to EG and CG. That's the experience exposure group, the comparison group, and for the outcomes, if you have an outcome in the exposure group, I've called that A. If you have an outcome in the comparison group, I've called that B. But the goal of every epidemiological study um, is to calculate the occurrence of outcomes in a group. This was Jerry Morris's epidemiology equals numerator over denominator. That's what it's, about. it's the whole goal. of Everything in epidemiology is about calculating Occurrence. So if you're critically appraising an epidemiological study, did they get the right numbers in the right places? Did they get the right people in the study? Did they get the right numbers? And I mean, I know you're talking about certainty and uncertainty. E epidemiology, by definition, is about uncertainty. Epidemiology is about probabilities. It's all about probabilities. Unless the probability is 0% or 100%, which is certainty, everything else is in epidemiology is about uncertainty. So, so I think one of the great things of epidemiology is the natural science of, of health and medicine because it's about uncertainty. It's all about probabilities. Um, it's not about certainty. A lot of basic biomedical science is reduc you know, reductionist and about certainty. My science is not about certainty. It's all about uncertainty. So it's the perfect science for medicine, my science, our science. It's the basic science of medicine. Um, so here's um, what I calculate. I calculate something called ego, the exposure group occurrence, which is the number of outcomes divided by the number of people in the exposure group. I then calculate SIGO, which is the comparison group occurrence which is the number of outcomes in the comparison group. Now, for simplicity, I haven't put time in there, but timing also has to go into this equation. So, um, oh, and here's your numerator. It even looks, I didn't do this on purpose, but there's your numerator is in this, sort of fits there, and there's your denominator. So actually, none of you can claim 100 pounds because if epidemiology is numerator over denominator, and the gate frame is basically numerator over de denominator, then by definition, the gate frame is the shape of every epidemiological study, unless I've missed something and Jerry Morris was wrong. And there's the T, the time is in there. I mean, in this example, if you look, I've, I've got, uh, this is my American women receive mammographic screening, so those women are mammographic negative, those positive. So um, the positive predictive value is among women with a positive mammogram, um, that number, have got breast cancer. So A over EG is the positive predictive value. If I'd done it the other way around, I'm not sure whether I've got it in this slide. Oh, I haven't, but if I, if I went, oh, I think I might have it in a subsequent slide. But here's ego and SIGO for that doctor's study. So ego is the occurrence of lung cancer and smokers. SIGO is the occurrence of lung cancer and non-smokers. Um, body mass, and oh, you can, I mean, it doesn't have to be a dichotomous outcome. It can be continuous. So ego could be the average, average blood glucose in overweight people, and SIGO can be the average blood glucose in normal weight people. And here's, here's the breast cancer one again. So this is a diagnostic test accuracy study. So among women with breast cancer, some have a positive test. So A over EG, ego, is sensitivity. 
Okay? The likelihood of a positive mammogram given breast cancer. I don't use words like sensitivity and specificity. I just use ego and sego because it's, um, that's what it's all about. Because in epidemiology, it's all about ego and sego. Now, if you want to talk relative risks, well, that's ego over sego. If you want to talk about risk differences, that's ego minus sego. But they're all measures of occurrence. They're measures of you know, risk, rate, likelihood, probabilities, averages, incidences, prevalences. But you can teach epidemiology without ever mentioning sensitivity, specificity, route of risk, risk difference, because it's all about ego and sego and comparing them. Um, is you, you know, one's going to be bigger than the other or not bigger than the other, and it's the difference that's important. So it allows you to get away from the jargon and just think, I always say, th look at the numbers. I think numbers are great. Look at the numbers. Put them, hang the numbers on the gate frame and look at them and look at them. So, okay, you've got the numbers. Um, so what? Well, um, the next thing you need to do is to decide if the numbers are any good. And um, I, I, I would like to acknowledge um, Paul Glazier here. Not that he looks at all like Rambo, um, but it was Paul Glazio's um, acronym. He had Rambo, I added the man, but um, simply because it helped identify all the key issues. And if you look at an epidemiological study, if you want to calculate ego and sego, you've got to get the num all the right numbers. So R is for recruitment. Did you recruit the right people? A is for allocation. Did you allocate people validly to the exposure and comparison groups? M is for maintenance. Once they've been allocated, did they stay there? Were they maintained in those groups? And then, if you're counting outcomes, did you measure your outcomes blindly or objectively? Did you measure them accurately? And then, did you do the analysis right? So these are all just m ways of trying to remember some of the key issues that whenever you look at an epidemiological study, whatever the study, um, you should be thinking of, of, of these issues. And, um, I'm not going to go through. I've talked about this to keep the time. 15, okay. I've got plenty of time, but I'm not going to push, go, spend too much time. But when I draw the triangle, um, that was the triangle that I normally show. But of course, those people who take part in a study are a subset of those who are eligible, and they come from some study setting. So uh, when I teach students about thinking about who participated, I draw these other groups to help them put it in the context. Um, I've talked about allocations, generally two ways that we allocate. We allocate randomly, and then your key question is, were the exposure group and comparison group similar at baseline, or we allocate by measurement or by observation, and you want to know, did we measure them accurately? Um, uh, I've talked about maintenance, that's issues of completeness of follow-up, compliance, contamination, co-intervention. You, you want the exposure group people to stay in that group, and you want the comparison group people to stay in that group. They never do, but how much, how many of them move? I mean, I, you know, as an aside, I'm in the middle of this big debate about saturated fat and coronary disease, and there's all this nonsense going around that saturated fat doesn't cause coronary disease. Based on the simplistic understanding of the hierarchy of evidence, because almost none of the randomized controlled trials where they've randomized people to saturated fat, high saturated fat or low saturated fat diet show any kind of clear or strong effect on coronary disease. Why? Well, you just can't do it. If you try randomizing people to a high saturated fat diet or a low saturated fat diet, follow them for 10 years, a few years in, they're all the same. So randomized controlled trials of diet and coronary disease are one of the lowest forms of evidence possible, not the highest. And yet there's this huge debate going on um, that the trials don't show anything, therefore there is no relationship. Simplistic thinking, incredibly simplistic thinking. Anyway, I digress. Um, so I've talked about measuring outcomes. Ideally, they're done blindly or objectively. I just use these pictures to keep the students awake. And then, um, then there's the analysis. Were the analyses done properly? Did you do ITT, intention to treat analysis? Uh, did you adjust for confounding? So, I mean, these are, uh, these are just the beginnings of conversations. Um, now, I just wanted to move on. So, Rambo Man is designed to identify the key causes of systematic error 
in, in, in epidemiological studies. My second formula, it's hardly a formula, random error equals 95% confidence interval. This is my one slide lecture on statistics to medical students. One slide. And I don't think as a medical student you need more than, sorry Doug, but um, well, <laughs> um, in fact, actually that's a quote from, that's, that's Doug's uh, definition of a 95% confidence interval. It's not puristic, but it's not pure, but it's close enough that there's about a 95% chance that the true value in the underlying population lies within the 95% confidence interval, assuming no non-random error. Sorry, I didn't reference it, but it comes straight out of something that, 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 that Doug wrote. And, you know, if it's all about ego and sego, then whenever you measure ego and sego, you also need to look at the 95% confidence interval because there's even uncertain, there's always uncertainty. So, so it's one thing I teach. That's my slide for medical students on statistics. Um, I also, systematic reviews, you can't, um, if you're looking at evidence-based practice, critical appraisal, of course you need to look at systematic reviews as well. And my third acronym is, is FAITH, and, and FAITH is an acronym for looking at systematic reviews. Here's the gate structure uh, picture for systematic reviews. So a systematic review is a study of studies. Um, you go searching for studies. Uh, you identify a group of studies. Uh, you then appraise the studies and allocate them to the good ones and the bad ones. And then if there is uh, no heterogeneity, you can then sum them. You can pull them in a meta-analysis. Now, um, if you want to critically appraise a systematic review, well, here, here you go. F is, did you find all the appropriate studies? A, did you appraise them? Or did they appraise them? And, and then I, this is the biggest, from my experience, the biggest weakness of um, systematic reviews is people spend so much time finding and then appraising studies and they're all pretty terrible, they can't help themselves but include the crap ones in the systematic review. So the I is probably the most important failing of all systematic reviews is which ones do they include? And then how do they total them up? We've got RevMan, did they check for heterogeneity? Simplistic, but a, but a starting point for looking at, at, at uh, systematic reviews. Um, so, fourth, my, my final section is, is, is about GATE as a framework for um, evidence-based practice. And you notice there's a cross at the, I haven't talked about the cross at, at the bottom. So um, when you're, you know, these are the standard steps of evidence-based practice, ask, access, appraise, apply and act. And you know, what both Iona and Trish were talking about is that fourth step today. How do you do that, the fundamental step? And, and I'll, I'll come to that with a cross. So step one about asking um, a, a focused question, well, that's just PCOT, um, the five parts. Accessing the evidence, will you use your question Usually the participants, the exposure, the outcomes, they're the usual ones that you use as search terms for finding the evidence. Then you appraise it. Well, that's what I've been discussing um, today. PCOT, Rambo Man, Ego and Sego, 95% confidence intervals. That's the critical appraisal. And then we get to the final part, which is um, the applying the evidence, which requires you to amalgamate the relevant evidence and other issues um, and, and this is where the X factor came from. It, it's it's um, interesting, I, for, for years I had the triangle circle and the square, and then one of my students said that, um, Rod, um, did you know that a Sony PlayStation also has an X? <laughs> and I was teaching a group of surgeons critical appraisal, and I was telling them the story about how one of my fourth year students had said, I need an X. And two weeks later, an orthopedic surgeon came back to me, he said, here's your X, Rod. And I talked about the importance of integrating evidence with all of the other factors, uh, and he simply just put um, those other factors into this frame. And so, I, I, you know, a clinician with the X factor, uh, the, the, the clinician that Iona is asking you to be and Trish was asking you to be, is the clinician with the X factor, the clinician who uses the evidence as a component of a decision, and the value, value, I mean, these are all of the standard components of a good decision. And, and um, 
in fact, this was discussed in, in EBM, in the EBM Journal in 2002. Um, interestingly, you know, people often talk about that evidence-based practice is the integration of the best evidence with patient values and uh, clinician expertise or something like that. And I've never totally understood what that expertise is. And in fact, to me, the expertise is the ability to put it all together, actually. And in fact, the, the art of medicine is the ability to put the science and the values and, and everything together. So anyway, that's my take on, on, on that. Well, there it is. If you've got the X factor, you can put these things together. You can put these things together. So, um, so that's the basis of GATE. Um, and I, of course, what GATE, the frame is, it's simply a pictorial version of the epidemiological paradigm. Uh, that's all it is. And um, so I use it both in teaching critical appraisal and in teaching design, because appraisal and design are uh, the flip sides of the same coin. But what I've tried to do is to make it, so it's designed to be accessible, as an accessible way of thinking about epidemiological evidence. And so what we've been doing over the years, we've, we've developed a number of um, toolkits, and, and our current ones, which are not on our website, but will go up soon because we've just developed them. We've, we've developed a, a series of three-sheet Excel workbooks. And the first sheet starts at the top with a clinical scenario. This is your five-part Peacock question. This is your search. And then you find an appropriate piece of evidence. The second sheet is, is called um, the gate appraise sheet. And down the left-hand side are the peacock components that you describe. In the middle, this is the gate frame, and you can plug in all the numbers. Down the right-hand side is the Rambo man. If you plug the numbers in here, it'll calculate ego, sego, confidence intervals, num relative risk, risk difference, numbers needed to treat. I haven't put it up here, but there's one for diagnostic tests. It actually has got the likelihood ratio nomogram on the side, and it all does it for you, so it's all there. And I'll be making those available very soon. We're just testing them. And then the final sheet is the X factor sheet, is that you take your epidemiological evidence and you look at these other components and then you come to a decision. And in, in, in my university, uh, all of, I give all of the fourth year medical students um, a six hour course in how to do this. And then what I do is I give them these forms and in each of their clinical attachments, I've managed to convince their clinical teachers to get rid of one of those inane case histories that they have to do and replace it with a cat and so one of these things. And so in one case history in each of their major attachments is replaced with this, which is just a way of going through the process of evidence-based medicine with a patient of their choice, with a problem of their choice. And then the clinician has to mark it. And so then the clinicians come to me and say, Rod, how do I mark it? And so then I teach them evidence-based practice <laughs> through the students. Um, and um, uh, various versions of these sheets have been, I don't know, um, have been published in, I think, six languages. This was uh, one of the Japanese people who sent me this photo. This was his Japanese gate. Um, this was a Malaysian one, I think or was it Turkish, I can't remember, and this was my colleagues in Auckland um, <laughs> 10 years ago, because I'm 60 now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just in case you were still hungry, which is unlikely, there's a question. I think we have time for one, because I know there's some workshops coming up, but there is a question, so could we have a mic, please? Thank you. Did I miss anybody else? Is there anybody else? By the way, this will go up on a website in the next few months called epic, epiq.co.nz. epiq.co.nz. I see two, and then we're going to have to, I've got to run, I've got to Thanks, Rod, for the <laughs> presentation. Uh, we have been teaching the gate frame at Cairo University, and we always have this problem of hanging quantitative data on the gate frame because we, it's only binary. How do you deal with that? 
I couldn't understand the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you, could you say it? Hey. The, the specific question for Rod, you're having trouble with the frame. Yeah, with the quantitative data. Quantitative? Yeah, not binary, because the outcome here is only binary. Oh. And in quantitative, we don't have CGO. Oh, you mean numerical? Yes, um, yes. On, on this current um, gate frame, underneath the square, you can put in numeric data with standard deviations or standard errors. So the current form allows you to put numeric data in. Do you have time to carry on? Yeah, we can talk later. Yeah, we can talk you. later. I don't know. I think it's Mike, Mike, there we are. I think it's the same question, but you're very clear that you can distinguish abnormal from normal. Oh. So what ab where do you put DCIS? So um, if you notice that on the gate frame, it's, um, I put a dotted, uh, just for some, to keep it nice and simple, I can't go backwards and forwards, but well, you can see it on there, it's dotted. The idea is that you can divide, that's, I'm using the most simplistic example, simplistic example of two groups. You can have numeric data as well. I mean, of course, epidemiological data can be divided into two groups, into four groups, and it can be done continuously as well. Yeah. So it is, it is designed. It's designed as a way of looking at the study, and you can divide it up in multiple ways. Okay, on that note, I think we finished, but thank you very much, and uh, I hope you all have lots to think about, and I'm sure you do. Thank you. Thank you, thanks, Rob.